Welcome to Understanding Duality Part 2, Scientific and Existential Dualities. So as promised, I'm going to be giving you a list of 250 dualities here. We covered uh, half of them in Part 1, and now the remaining half now here in Part 2. Let's continue right where we left off. Before we actually get to the list, though, let's clear up a couple of points that are important. So when we use the word duality, this is a little bit deceptive because it makes you think that we're talking about polarities that always come in pairs of two and not more right so when i say duality you think of like black versus white good versus evil cat versus dog this sort of stuff and then so when i'm teaching about this topic of duality then you're going to go out into the world you're going to look for these dualities and what's going to happen is that you're not going to always find a polar opposite for every situation or what you might find is you might find categories of three or four or more things, and you're going to wonder how that fits in and relates to duality. So here's what you got to understand is that when we use the word duality, we're really using it to contrast with non-duality, which means with oneness. So you can have categories which are more than two parts. It doesn't have to be just two. It can be two or three or four or infinite number of Categories. In fact, that's how exactly how it works. There's an infinite number of these categories that that we create. So, for example, take take a look at this. We've got theism, atheism, and agnosticism. That's a three part distinction. There. That's still a duality. <laughs> okay, under what I'm saying. Also, we have straight, gay, or bisexual. That's a three-part distinction there. And you can have more. For example, the color spectrum. You can have colors like red, blue, green, yellow, purple, orange. You can even have infrared and ultraviolet. These are all categories that we create within color. But it doesn't just end there. It's even more complicated than that. See, duality is multidimensional. So like with this color spectrum example, I want you to see that what we have here really is duality within duality. Because yes, we can distinguish red from blue, from green, from yellow, and so forth, but that's all within the duality called color. And now color is distinct from, now we're kind of going up one level, is distinct from smell, sound, feeling, emotion and other things like that thoughts see that's separate so we're creating a multiple part duality there between these various kinds of sensations and then we're creating further dualities within each duality of sensation so we can create dualities within color within smell within sound and so forth like we can have loud sounds or we can have quiet sounds see or we can have sweet smells or we can have bitter nasty smells but those are just sensations of course, what is sensation but another duality? Because sensation is contrasted against something else, something that's the opposite of sensation. Um, maybe you want to contrast sensation against thoughts or concepts or something else. So uh, you see how this gets very tricky? You create with your mind dualities within dualities within dualities within dualities. It gets very complicated. So. Bear that in mind, and it can have many parts. For example, you might take cat and dog as a duality, and uh, you ask most people kind of simplistically, what's the opposite of a cat? And they'll say, well, a dog. And what's the opposite of a dog? Well, it's a cat. Okay, that, that's easy. A child knows that. But then someone in the, in the comments under the last episode asked, well, Leah, what's the opposite of a panda bear? See? <laughs> and, and here, you have to understand that Really, when we're creating the duality between cat and dog, it's not simply that we're defining the cat relative to the dog. We're also defining the cat relative to a bunch of other stuff. So, for example, 
really, when we say cat as a duality, what we're saying is cat versus non-cat. That's the, the highest level of, of distinction that we're making. And then you can find opposites like dog and so forth. So for example, with, with panda bear, what's the opposite of a panda bear? Well, when we say panda bear, what we're doing is we're specifying something. That's what it means to create a distinction or a duality. These words, distinction, duality, category, I'm using them interchangeably here. So, uh, in a certain sense, the opposite of a panda bear is a non-panda bear. And what is a non-panda bear? Well, it's a table, it's a car, it's a tree, it's any of those things. So a panda bear is distinct from a tree, a car, a table, a human, and so forth. But if we, if we want to get a little bit more specific, we say, well, panda bear also is designating a very specific type of bear. So we could say a panda bear is distinct from a brown bear, a black bear, a polar bear, a cartoon bear, uh, and uh, and so so forth, you know, whatever other kind of bears there are. And then we can also say, well, of course, bear is a specific type of distinction or duality which separates that particular kind of animal from other animals. And of course, you know, you can have a whole hierarchy of different kinds of animal, animals, mammals, living things, sentient things. All of these are dualities, you see. So what's the opposite of toilet paper? Not toilet paper. When we say toilet paper, we're specifically excluding everything that's not toilet paper, which is literally the entire universe minus toilet paper, you see? So we're kind of playing with these sets here. But uh, you might get the sense that even though I'm talking about these distinctions and dualities, that what I'm talking about is concepts and that I'm talking about different ideas and beliefs that you can have in your mind, different ways of looking at the world. <laughs> but what I'm saying is much more profound than that. We're not merely talking about concepts and ideas. A concept and an idea is itself a duality. You gotta really contemplate, this is very, very tricky stuff. Because what you're gonna be tempted to do is you're gonna be tempted to somehow weaken the notion of duality by grounding it in some sort of thing, which itself is a duality as well. So you're gonna say, well, Leo, you might say, uh, these are just these are just ideas in the mind. All this duality business is just philosophy in the mind. And then if we throw all that away, we've got like the real hard stuff, the science, the facts, the stuff you can't argue with. But what I'm telling you is that that thing that you're saying you can't argue with, the real hard facts, the science, the, the reality, the objective truth, I'm telling you that that thing <laughs> is also a duality. So then where does that leave us? It leaves us groundless. It leaves us groundless. And that seems like a mistake, but that's not a mistake. That's exactly how it is. So watch out for that. Also, I want you to notice that all qualifications are dualities. What do I mean by qualifications? I mean any quality whatsoever. So take any object, and we can now qualify it by using language or ideas to specify qualities of the object. So we can say like, well, is this object big or small? It's big, okay, so it's big. What, what other qualities does it have? Well, is it, is it hairy or is it smooth? Okay, it's hairy. And is it sharp or is it uh, jagged? Okay, it, it's jagged. And is it, is it loud or is it quiet? Okay, it's quiet. And does it have eyes or not? Okay, so it's, it's got eyes. And does it make noise? Uh, well, we already said that. Okay, so um, what else? Uh, is it skinny or is it tall? You see, so, so we can just keep going with qualities. So any object that you know, for it to be an object, it has to have specific qualities. Otherwise, you say it doesn't exist. But see, you also hold existence and non-existence as qualities, which is also quite dualistic. See? So my point is that I want you to start to become aware that this, this notion of duality is much more ubiquitous than it first seems. At first it seems like, oh, dualities, they're just like these little categories that we create. But then you start looking around the world more and more and you realize, wait a minute, what isn't a duality? And that's exactly right. You're starting to see just how powerful this, this notion is. So all the ways that you think about reality are dualistic. 
what would it even mean for you to have a thought about an object that has no qualities to it whatsoever? You might say, well, that object doesn't exist then. Ah, but that's a duality. You create a duality between existence and non-existence. So you can't even say that it doesn't exist because you're qualifying it by saying that. See how tricky this is? Also, I want you to notice that all of your questions about life, pretty much, are infested with dualistic assumptions. So, for example, you might ask, well, Leo, so just be straight with me. Are other people real or not? Now, just take that line of thought. Are other people real or not? Other is a duality. People is a duality. Real is a duality. Not is a duality. See? How about a question like, Leo, does free will exist? I'm confused. Tell it to me straight. Well, free is a duality. Will is a duality. Exist is a duality. Leo, are we in a computer simulation? Tell it to me straight. Computer is a duality. We is a duality. Simulation is a duality. Leo, can computers become sentient? Tell it to me straight. Again, computer is a duality. Sentient is a duality. Leo, is God real or not? Tell it to me straight. God, as you hold it, is a duality. You might wonder, well, who created God? Creation is a duality. Whether you say God exists or doesn't exist, you're creating dualities. Now, of course, there's God with a capital G, the actual God, the absolute. Now, that's something we talked about in part one. Remember that there is an absolute. And so that thing, it's something, but you don't know what it is. And it's not within the realm of duality. It transcends duality. <laughs> Leo, will science ever understand consciousness? Science is a duality. Consciousness, the way you hold it, is a duality. Now, there is a consciousness with a capital C. That's an absolute. That's God. Um, but when you talk about consciousness, when ordinary people talk about consciousness, they're, they're talking about a dualistic version of consciousness. Consciousness as contrasted with unconsciousness. There's no such thing when you're at the absolute. When you're at the absolute, there's no such thing as unconsciousness. There's only consciousness with capital C, but we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Leo, is it possible to eliminate evil? Possible is a duality, contrasted with impossible. Eliminate, that's like destruction. That's a duality, destruction versus creation. Evil, that's of course a duality between good and evil. Leo, is Western culture superior to other cultures? Western, of course, is a duality. Culture is a duality. Superior versus inferior is a duality. Other is a duality. Leo, is masturbation good or bad? Should I stop masturbating? Masturbation is a duality. Good is a duality. Bad is a duality. Should is a duality. Leo, should I focus on my life purpose or on spirituality? I'm confused. Again, should is a duality. Focus is a duality. Life purpose is a duality. Spirituality is a duality in the way that you hold it. Confusion is a duality. You're either confused or you're not confused. You see? So, most people, they get caught up on the questions and the content of the questions and trying to get an answer, some sort of verbal, logical answer, without going kind of meta and just kind of looking at the questions that they're asking. See, philosophy and science is chock full, completely infested with dualistic notions. And that's why science and philosophy struggles to answer some of the biggest metaphysical existential questions in life, because they're not conscious of the thing that I'm trying to make you conscious of right now. So don't be so focused on getting your questions answered. Rather, be focused on 
the assumptions that are in your questioning and in your philosophy and in your science. It's the kind of questions you ask that's really more important than the answers you get. By the way, questions and answers. What is that but another duality? Anyhow, enough of this uh, preamble. Let's get right into the list. So, we're getting into the uh, portion of the scientific dualities. The following list of dualities is critical for you to understand if you're going to be a decent scientist or intellectual of any kind. If you do not understand this list, you are basically negligent as an intellectual, and you will commit dualistic blunders, and you will not have an ultimate understanding of reality. And in fact, your understanding of reality will be very confused, twisted, and distorted, and you're going to delude yourself and anybody who reads or follows your work. That's how, that's how significant this is. So, uh, pay attention here. All right. So, the first uh, example is the duality of solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. You know this from physics class, right? So, in, uh, in science, in physics, they will tell you that, well, you know, matter goes through various kinds of states. It can be a solid, a liquid, a gas, a plasma, and so forth. And then, when you're told this, you tend to take it as a dogma, and you tend to say, well, yeah, it's either a solid, or it's a liquid, or it's a gas, or it's a plasma, and it has to be one of those four, and it can't be anything else. But of course, what you discover if you actually start to do serious science is you discover if you take a microscope and you kind of zoom into a liquid, that liquid is not always pure liquid. Even if it's standing at room temperature, you take a glass of water standing at room temperature. Is it liquid? Well, it seems liquid, but when you zoom in on it, what you see is that actually, if we, if we want to be technical and accurate, there's always molecules bouncing around, and some portion of the molecules, let's say the, the majority of them, are a liquid if it's at room temperature and it's water on uh, you know, standard atmosphere pressure on Earth, that's going to be true. But then there's, even in that situation, there's always a portion of those molecules bouncing around which are going too fast and they're literally turning into gas and they're evaporating. Which is why if you leave your glass of water um, in, a, in a sort of a dry environment, if you're not in some very humid place like Florida maybe, uh, if you're in a dry place like where I live in Las Vegas, then you leave a glass of water out overnight half that glass is going to evaporate overnight because it's so dry. How does that happen? In science class, they told you, you got to boil water for the water to turn into gas. Well, that's not actually true because there's always some portion of that liquid that's always turning into gas. See? And so the reason I'm giving you this example is because it starts to fuck with your mind and it starts to break apart uh, these rigid categories, these simplistic black and white categories that you hold in your mind. See, And you're always going to find that this is the case. Anywhere in life that you believe there's a firm category and some firm boundary that cannot be broken, if you explore that boundary deeply enough, far enough, eventually you'll discover that it breaks and that it bleeds into something else. Uh, another example for you. Conductor versus insulator versus semiconductor versus superconductor. This is really interesting because we've got conductors and insulators, but then we've got semiconductors. What's a semiconductor? Sometimes it's conductor, sometimes it's not. What the hell is that about? See, so it so the semiconductor, the existence of a semiconductor proves to you the the permeability of that boundary between a conductor and an insulator. And then we have something even weirder, which is superconductors. We have materials, for example, that don't conduct electricity at all unless you freeze them to near absolute zero temperatures, and then they become superconductors. It's a very counterintuitive sort of result, and it's kind of paradoxical and freaky. See? So, the value to a scientist of the things that I'm talking about now is that what it does is it frees up your mind to think outside of various kinds of pigeonholes that the scientific establishment pushes upon you when you learn science in school and in university. 
So for example, a couple hundred years ago, people knew about conductors and insulators, but they didn't know about semiconductors and superconductors, right? So if you were a rigid scientist who was schooled in the theory that there's conductors and insulators and that they're opposites and that there's nothing else, then you're gonna learn that and then you're never gonna be able to discover a superconductor because you're gonna look at the, the thing and you're gonna say, well, it must be either a conductor or an insulator, but it can't be both. It can't be a semiconductor or it can't be or something that's an insulator can't become a conductor at, at certain temperatures that would violate these categories. Yes, but who created the categories? Of we did, of course, humans did. You see, this is how scientists delude themselves. They think they're doing good science, but really um, their science is going through the filters of their categories. And then those, those categorical filters are what distorts the science. And there's, there's so much more that can be said about this, but we have to move on. How about the duality of land versus water? You think, well, clearly they're opposites, but are they really? Go to the beach. Try to find the boundary between land and water when you're actually at the beach. It's really hard to pinpoint. You've got waves splashing around, water soaking through the sand. Where does the water end and the sand begin? See, it's not so easy. Not so easy at all. And if, if you really want to understand how land and how water work in all of their accuracy and complexity, you can't approach it with this rigid boundary. You need to be much more nuanced and you need to study how land and water work as forces pushing and pulling on each other. Land shapes the way that water flows. It shapes the actual shape of the water is conforming to some kind of land. Even if you think about the entire ocean, the entire ocean, if we think of one ocean in the entire world, all the oceans added together, that's one ocean. And it's being held in a sort of beaker, which is the, the earth. See, so the shape of the water is determined by the land, but also of course the land, the shape of the land is determined by the water. It goes both ways. You know, you look at the Grand Canyon, for example, which is uh, pretty close to where I live, and uh, you, you see how the land was shaped by the water. And often it doesn't take a lot of water to shape a massive chunk of land. See, geologists, geologists understand this really well. They appreciate this. How about the distinction of the geosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the atmosphere? We can easily take these as separate things. We can have a scientist who studies the geosphere, another one who studies the hydrosphere, another one who studies the biosphere, another one who studies the atmosphere, and these scientists could not talk to each other their entire life because you know they're just kind of siloed and they've got their uh, blinders on just working on one of their fields. But of course, all of these spheres interpenetrate and work with each other. And if you really want to understand the geosphere, you better understand the hydrosphere, the biosphere, and the atmosphere, because all those spheres shape the geosphere. And, you know, conversely as well. The biosphere is shaped by the geosphere, the hydrosphere is shaped by the atmosphere, and so it's a, it's a complicated nest. And it's not so easy to tell where one ends and the other begins. For example, you know, termites, they'll build a big termite mound out of earth. So that now becomes part of the geosphere is what the termites built. But it wouldn't be part of the geosphere unless these biological entities, the termites built it. And of course, where did the termites come from? Well, of course, they're made out of uh, molecules coming from the geosphere ultimately, you know. Um, so there you go. How about the distinction of planets, asteroids, and planetoids? Um, some years back, Pluto was declassified from being a planet to being a planetoid. <laughs> it didn't quite qualify as a planet. What happened there? Some people were upset about it. Some people were for it. Some people were against it. Is Pluto a planet? Is it an asteroid? What's the difference between an asteroid and a planet anyways? 
Is a planet just a giant asteroid? Or is it something more? And what about planetoids? What the hell is a planetoid? Something in between a planet and an asteroid? You see? Uh, it's not so clear. Not so clear at all. How about the distinction or the category of life versus non-life? This issue of defining what is life is notoriously difficult for scientists. When they're planning uh, various missions to other planets like Mars, the Moon, um, and elsewhere in our solar system and beyond, uh, scientists have been thinking about this. How are we going to even determine whether the stuff that we find on some remote planet is actually going to be life? Because there might be some weird stuff there, but it might not have DNA. You know, we we define life on Earth usually as stuff that has DNA, but what if this alien life doesn't have DNA? It uses some other mechanism. And, we, you know, we define human life on Earth here as, as kind of like carbon-based life forms. But what if we find life forms that are silicon-based or some other uh, material that we haven't considered before? some other element. Um, and how will we, we really know? And if you, if you investigate the, the research into how did life actually come about on the planet at all, it's, it's a very mysterious and tricky topic. It's not simple at all. Scientists have virtually no idea how life came about from inorganic matter. It's, it's actually... Uh, one of the greatest puzzles and mysteries of the universe that still needs to be answered. How does something non-living become living? And what is that exact moment? What is that boundary that's crossed that a non-living thing becomes a living thing? What was the very first living thing that ever came into existence in our universe? Was there even such a thing? After all, who's creating this category of living versus non-living? Us, humans? See, very, very tricky. It's not so easy to devise a test to determine whether something is alive or not. How about the duality of inanimate versus animate? That's another one that's very similar to the one we just discussed. How about the duality of plant versus animal? At first blush, it seems like, well, it's easy to tell a plant from an animal. Any child can do it, can tell a cat from a tree. But when you actually get into the nitty gritty details, you're gonna encounter situations in the, uh, in the biosphere where you can't quite distinguish a plant from an animal. Corals, for example, various kinds of corals become uh, an interesting example. Various kinds of fungi and mushrooms, you know, they kind of blur the lines between plants and animals. Uh, certain corals, they have properties of animals, but also plants. Like they can, they can do photosynthesis, for example, and they can get uh, energy from, from the sun. But at the same time, most corals, they actually eat uh, fish and they eat various kinds of uh, shrimp and, and uh, dead living matter. Very interesting. So see, it would be very wrong headed of us if we were trying to explore the universe to go to a new planet, exploring that planet with a very simple distinction of plant versus animal in our mind or living versus non-living in our mind. We need to be much more open-minded. Otherwise, we might discover something there that doesn't quite fit one of our existing categories. That's one of the whole tricks of doing science is that precisely because science is about pushing the boundary of discovery and discovering new things in the universe, we need to be very, very open to new categories of things, which, uh, which a lot of times, honestly, scientists are just closed-minded to, because you know they get drilled in their in their skull this idea that well, a subatomic particle must either be a proton or an electron or some other on, <laughs> uh, but it can't be some some totally new thing. Or if, if there's, a, if there's a, a fundamental physical 
object, then it must be either energy or it must be matter, but it can't be anything else. Well, but what if we discover something out there in the universe that's not energy or matter, but it's a third kind of thing? Are you going to be open-minded to it? Or are you going to be rigid and dogmatic and say that, no, Leo, it has to either be matter or it has to be energy and it can't be anything else? You'd be surprised at how many very intelligent scientists who have won Nobel Prizes and have many PhDs, but still, they, they go wrong on this very simple point. So it's, it's simple, but it's, it's very tricky. How about the duality of animal versus human? We touched on this in part one. How do you really determine the difference between an animal and a human? And after all, a human is an animal, right? Many humans behave more like animals, and many animals are actually more humane than humans. <laughs> so ironic, huh? And, you know, if we start to tinker with our genetic DNA, which is already starting to happen, you know, they're already starting to clone feed uh, embryos and babies and stuff and modify DNA using CRISPR and all this stuff. You probably heard about this in the news recently. Well, um, at what point do we do so much uh, modification to our DNA that our children are no longer going to be human? What is going to be the first baby born from a human which will not be human anymore? And what will we call it? And how will we make that determination? And then, of course, you know, with that come a lot of other questions like, well, does that, does this superhuman baby, does it deserve human rights or does it deserve more rights than regular humans? And then what do we have? Do we have two classes now of, of humans? We have the old humans and the new superhumans. You see how many problems this will create politically, socially, culturally. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of, you know, uh, racist type issues that will come up again, uh, legal issues. See, very tricky. How about the distinction between hardware and software? Go take a look at your computer. Where does the hardware end and the software begin? Can you separate them out? Have you noticed that all software is happening within a hardware medium. So is there even such a thing as software? When you go to the store and you pick up a Adobe Photoshop or Microsoft Office or something like that, you get it on a CD. That CD is hardware. You may say, well, you know, I, I download. I'm too sophisticated. I don't go to the store anymore. I buy all my software online. I just download it. Right. But it, where is it stored? On a physical server. And when it gets to your computer, where is it stored? It's stored on some sort of solid state drive or some spinning disk. Where does your computer hardware end and your operating system begin? See, this is a really tricky issue. It's not so clear. How about the duality between digital and analog? That one's really interesting, too. People tend to treat that one as though, well, you've either got digital or you've got analog and you can't have any combination in between. But all digital stuff ultimately is, in a sense, analog. Like, for example, you might have a digital CD, music CD. But if I scratch that CD with a key, then uh, it will skip around and stop working. So see, I use some analog thing, like a key to make some scratches. These are analog things on a digital device, and I, I ruined it, corrupted the data. Or I could take a digital hard drive, like a solid state drive. I could um, you know, hit it with a hammer. That's going to be an analog action on a digital device. And uh, of course, that digital mechanism is going to be broken because, of, because ultimately it's, it's analog in a certain sense. That interesting. How about uh, matter versus energy? I think we touched on that in part one. I shouldn't um, talk too much about that. But hopefully you can see how matter and energy um, are not so clearly separate as we once thought. Einstein's whole brilliance was the equation E equals MC squared, equating matter and energy to each other. 
when a nuclear explosion goes off, all that energy comes from a conversion of a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of matter into a lot, a lot, a lot of energy. See? So it turns out that these, these two things are not separate, as we once thought. Of course, now we take it completely for granted that this is obvious and easy, and it's like, Leo, so what? Everybody knows this. <laughs> but a hundred years ago, nobody knew it. And the whole point is that when it's first being discovered, there's so much closed-mindedness and dogma and resistance that people are shocked by these discoveries and they reject them and they get very fundamentalist about it because what you got to realize is that the categories that you accept that you hold as normal are simply those that were indoctrinated into you from birth in whatever generation era you grew up in. How about the duality of matter versus antimatter? It's really interesting. Could there be a third kind? Something in between? How about electricity and magnetism as a duality? A couple hundred years ago, physicists thought that electricity and magnetism were separate phenomena. And then, of course, electricity and, and magnetism were unified. That took a genius like Maxwell with his equations to unify electricity and magnetism. That was a huge discovery leading to all sorts of new technology and new possibilities. Seems obvious today, but it wasn't obvious at all. It took a genius to realize that. How about space and time as a duality? Most people still think, think of space and time as a duality, but the genius of Einstein and realized that it took a genius like Einstein to have the flexibility and open-mindedness necessary to realize that actually space and time are not separate things the way that Newton thought and others before him thought, but that they're, they're integrally connected there's a deep and profound relationship between the two. And from that, we got a whole new physics. Complete paradigm shift came from that. It's the quintessential example of what a paradigm shift is. And it takes a genius to realize that precisely because genius requires radical open-mindedness and a very um, fluid approach to these categories. You have to be able to see new categories that's not easy to do. How about the duality of quantum mechanics versus relativity? A lot of physicists today, they specialize either in quantum mechanics or relativity. Of course, some, some can do both. But they usually have a specialty. And there's this classic problem within physics right now is that general relativity, Einstein's theories, are really good at explaining how the universe works at the macro largest scale, at the scale of universes and stars and planets and so forth. Really high quality, ha accurate theorems there. Um, and then quantum mechanics is extremely accurate at predicting behaviors at the micro, tiny subatomic level. And we use quantum mechanics to build amazing computers and so forth. Even though our computers are not quantum mechanical yet, uh, we do use the principles of quantum mechanics to manufacture CPUs and smartphones and other stuff that you know you use every day but you don't even realize depends on quantum mechanical principles and theorems. So, um, so both of these theories are very well tested, but scientists already know that there has to be some sort of unification, reconciliation, because general relativity does not work at the micro scale of subatomic particles, and quantum mechanics does not work at the you know, explaining the, the very large phenomenon of galaxies and, and uh, planets and so forth. So how are we going to reconcile those two? Scientists still don't know. It's really tricky. It's going to take a genius to come in there and redraw the lines and uh, redo these dualities and categories to somehow merge them together. But don't expect that to be something obvious 
and don't expect everybody in the scientific community to just automatically accept it once that person discovers it because they're going to be operating under the old paradigm, under the old dualities and categories. How about the duality of theory versus practice? These two are integrally related. A lot of times people will set these up as somehow opposites or conflicting with each other. It happens within personal development. It happens within spirituality, but it also happens, for example, within science. So, you know, within spirituality, the way it happens is that people sometimes criticize me and say, oh, Leo, you're so theoretical. You talk about all this theoretical stuff, but really all that needs to be taught is just the practices. That's very dangerous. If you teach people just practices with no theory, then they're not going to have the proper framework. And they're going to misunderstand and misapply the practices or the things that they discover through the practices will be misunderstood, misinterpreted, and improperly embodied. On the other hand, of course, it's true that if all people get is spiritual theory and no practices, then they will also be very deluded and become pathological because you're going to have all these ideas. It's just going to be mental masturbation, no practice, and that's not going to work. So you need to delicately balance theory and practice. In fact, I have a whole episode. One of my most important episodes of all time is uh, one that I think most people don't appreciate. Most of you guys don't appreciate it. Um, but it's very practical and important. It's my episode about balancing theory and practice. Go search for it. How about the duality related also to this is uh, the duality between theory and reality. Some people, they get a little bit of experience with spiritual work and then they become too they become too conscious leo i'm, I'm too conscious i'm too i'm too woke for theory reality is what i want <laughs> you're too woke for theory <laughs> that makes me laugh theory is extremely important you can't separate them so easily. In fact, by separating theory from spirituality, you in fact create the duality that you're supposed to transcend by being non-dual. How can you be truly non-dual when you don't realize the intimate connection between theory and reality? When you're not even appreciating the fact that theory is reality. Theory is a part of reality. You can't separate the two. And what is the exact relationship between theory and reality? Well, that's a, that's really tricky and really profound. That's a, not easy to answer, so I can't answer it here for you. But that's something you should contemplate if you're serious about your science or even about your spirituality. If you're dismissing one or the other, watch out, you're making a mistake. How about the duality of system versus environment or organism versus environment? A lot of times in science, the system and the environment are treated as separate things because science likes to simplify stuff, create simple models, and they can be useful, but eventually they all break down because you can't have an object and its environment as two separate things because the object is always within the environment, always responding to the environment, always living and surviving within the environment. And where does, where does my environment begin and I end? <laughs> you see? Like I'm sitting here, I'm talking to you, and it might seem like I am separate from my environment. But am I really? No. Because that environment, the air that I'm surrounded with, it's entering my lungs right now. How do you separate the air in the atmosphere here with the, from the air that's in my lungs and in my blood and supplying my brain with, with the oxygen it needs in order to, to process all this information and to, to speak to you right now? And the speaking that's happening, that's air waves 
you know, oscillations in air that's happening that my, my throat, um, muscles and, and all this, the voice box is producing all this. So there's, there's a, a seamless interface between any organism and its environment. And that's extremely important to understand. And of course, science does understand this. A good scientist understands this. Um, but still, oftentimes not deeply enough. Not deeply enough. To really understand an organism, for example, you need to understand the environment that it lives in. Charles Darwin made some great discoveries and breakthroughs in understanding that. But still, not enough. Like, you have to, like, really look at the entire earth very holistically because the way that, for example, geese migrate from north to south and so forth, you know, that depends on various jet streams and winds that are blowing, you know, through the earth's atmosphere, which of course depends on various temperature changes, global warming, uh, solar flares and the position of the earth relative to the sun all of this all of this affects how geese navigate and of course the the goose's navigational system that it has in, in its brain is of course dependent on the earth on the earth's uh, magnetic poles what if we had a pole reversal which happens every couple hundred thousand years or so um uh, or every million years, I don't know how often it happens, but pole reversals do happen on this planet where north and south gets flipped. Scientists still don't really understand why that happens. Uh, but, you know, that's going to screw with the goose <laughs> migration patterns. Might kill all the geese. Or maybe some new goose will evolve. Right? You got you to see how all this is interconnected. And that's what systems thinking is. So when you become a really good systems thinking, see my episode... Intro to Systems Thinking, that's a very profound and powerful episode too, um, where you start to learn how to look at the world in terms of systems, not individual elements, how every element is interacting with other elements in this complicated web. And this is sort of a, the beginning of holistic thinking. Very important to start to, to look at the world that way. And uh, uh, most people can't do that because they're stuck in their very rigid dualities. How about the duality of inorganic versus organic? Where is that boundary between the two? How about the duality between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells? Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus with DNA. Prokaryotic cells don't. So the prokaryotic cells came first. And supposedly the theory is, and we're not quite sure, that the uh, prokaryotic cells somehow evolved into the eukaryotic cells probably by absorbing another cell. And that other cell that they absorbed was some kind of nucleus thing, and it absorbed it, or some, some theory like this. So literally, the eukaryotic cell is kind of made up of multiple prokaryotic cells, or at least that's how, how it might have come into being. So you can't quite separate the two. How about... Sentient versus non-sentient as a duality. This is really profound. What is sentience? Most scientists don't appreciate the, the depth of this question. What is sentience? Is sentience something that an object has? Like a computer can just become sentient, but a rock cannot? Or a human can? Or a, maybe a dog can, but a, uh, you know, a chair cannot. Can a tree or a plant be sentient? Are they already sentient? Are they non-sentient? Are they somewhere in the middle, semi-sentient? What was the first sentient thing that ever came into being in the universe? And what had to happen for it to stop being non-sentient and become sentient? Or maybe the entire universe is sentient. Maybe sentience is a transcendent absolute. That's something you have to discover for yourself. How about the duality of nature versus nurture? This is a very thorny issue. A lot of debates have been waged over this. You know, is something nature or is it nurture? Being gay, 
Is that nature or is that nurture? Is it how you were raised or is it in your genetics? Could it be both? Is it possible that the way you're raised affects your genetics and that affects whether you become gay or not? For example, when you are not yet born, but in your mother's belly, maybe something happens to your mother. She gets more testosterone or more stress or more estrogen in her system for whatever reason. Which, of course, you know, that usually comes from environmental reasons, like maybe your mother is in a war zone or she's abused or whatever happens. And then maybe that triggers something within you because you're now attached part of your mother. Speaking of which, you know, where do you end and your mother begin? Especially when you're inside her belly. Uh, see, very tricky. So at that point, you're not even separate from your mother yet. You are your mother, literally. So the environment affects your mother. That, of course, affects how your brain wires and all of this, depending on testosterone, estrogen, and so forth, these various kinds of hormones. Various science and studies have been done on this. You can go research those, and you discover that it matters. It matters whether your mother is in a war zone, or she's stressed, or she's abused, or she's taking drugs, or whatever. That affects you <laughs> um, to the point where it might make the difference between you being gay, or straight, or bi, or transsexual, or whatever. And I'm not saying that's the only cause. I'm just saying it, it's a factor. So where do you draw these lines between environment and genetics? It's not so simple at all. In fact, this whole notion of a fixed, rigid set of genetics that you just are born with and that you have to now live with for the rest of your life has been completely debunked in the last 50 years of, of biology. It's complete horseshit. There is no such thing as a rigid genetics. Your genes are constantly expressing themselves in various ways with a very complicated interrelationship between you the food you eat, your environment, and everything that's going on around you. Literally, my words, the words coming out of my mouth, can enter your ears and change the way that your genetics is expressed. This is called epigenetics. It's the notion that genetics are affected by environment and vice versa. Literally, that's possible. And in fact, if you watch enough of my videos, What's going to happen is that your whole mind is going to rewire from this theory, from this philosophy. Your whole mind will rewire. But what is that? But it's going to also shift your genetics. Literally, your DNA will change from watching actualize.org. People don't appreciate any of this. And then people become victims and say, oh, well, Leo, I'm just fat. I have ADD. I'm depressed. I suck. My life sucks because of my genetics. It's all my genetics. Of course, genetics are important. I'm not denying genetics. But it's very easy to, be, uh, to start to use genetics as a sort of a victim mindset. It's very convenient. The ego loves some idea of some rigid genetics. And you can say, well, my genetics, my genetics were bad, so I'm bad at math. My genetics are bad, so I'm bad at meditation. I'll never awaken. I'll never become a Buddha because I got shit genetics. See, but this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's a really dangerous and tricky duality. Genetics and environment. It's not so simple at all. How about the duality between first person and third person? In science, this is one of the major paradigmatic sticking points of current materialist science is that they tend to split the world into first-person phenomena and third-person phenomena. And they don't just do that, but they also assign value and priority to the third-person uh, phenomena, third-person results. So, for example... Uh, a scientist is skeptical of first-person phenomena, anecdotal results. But the scientist is not conscious that all of his science is itself first-person phenomena. Point to one thing that has ever happened in your life that was not first-person. Direct experience. If it's not direct experience, it doesn't exist for you at all. You might say, well, Leo, science, you know, 
Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity, that's not a first person thing. That's based on scientific theory validated, you know, um, with double blind placebo controlled studies and experiments and evidence and computers and other scientists have confirmed it and verified it and all of this. Yes, and all of that is first person happening within you. And most scientists don't get this. It falls on deaf ears. If you don't understand this one di distinction right here, um, your entire foundation of doing science will be misguided and you will do bad science. That's how important this stuff is. Speaking of science, let's tackle some dualities regarding science. I mean the actual uh, discipline of science. For example, the duality between science and philosophy or science and metaphysics. This is another sticking point for many scientifically minded people is they tend to think that science is distinct from philosophy and science is distinct from metaphysics. Science is good, science is rigorous, science is true, and metaphysics and philosophy, this is just mental masturbation, it's just theories, it has nothing to do with science. Except, of course, this is a totally ignorant position, completely ahistorical. If you know your history of where science came from, you know what science used to be called? There was not science 500 years ago. There was natural philosophy. Science evolved out of natural philosophy. Of course, that's been forgotten conveniently by many scientists today. Of course, in theory, they know it, but in practice, they don't actually practice it. They don't embody it because they treat metaphysics as some sort of separate and bad boogeyman field that is corrupting science if you engage in it, where actually it's the opposite. You see, when you're doing science without having done metaphysics, all that means is that you're doing science using very shoddy, unconscious, materialist metaphysics. You're sneaking the metaphysics in there into your science, into all of your experiments and all of your interpretations of your experiments, is completely infested with a terrible metaphysics. But because you deny that metaphysics is important or relevant to what you're doing, you don't even know this. That's how ignorant you are. You're so ignorant of metaphysics, you don't even know that you have a metaphysics. And that is completely corrupting all of your science and all of your thinking. That's how significant this duality is. It's so easy to discount philosophy. Yet, if you look historically, philosophy is one of the most significant and impactful and practical fields, especially within Western civilization, but I mean, even in Eastern civilization too. Look at how philosophy has shaped Eastern civilization in China, in Japan, uh, in India deeply philosophical cultures. But of course, in the West, it's also very philosophical. The whole notion of Western civilization basically stemmed from Athens and from Greece and from Rome. Um, and look how philosophical they were. The greatest philosophers were also the greatest scientists. If you want to be a hack scientist, don't study philosophy ever or metaphysics. If you want to be a genius, cutting edge, Einstein level scientist, Study philosophy and metaphysics. It's not an accident that, that our greatest scientists who made the, the biggest breakthroughs were deeply interested in metaphysical and philosophical topics, whether it's Isaac Newton or Kurt Gödel or Albert Einstein or Niels Bohr or Schrodinger, David Bohm. I, I mean, I could just keep rattling <laughs> on and on. This list doesn't end. Science is actually just a subset of philosophy. That's all it is. It's a subset of metaphysics. It's a subset of epistemology. How about the duality between science and math? In universities, sometimes they're treated as separate ob subjects. There's like the math department and the physical science department, and they're separate. But of course, they're not separate because there wouldn't be modern science without math. 
And of course, what is math but the science of numbers? <laughs> That's all math is. It's the science of numbers. How about the duality between science and art? These seem so separate and so different. You have the artsy people, and then you have the nerdy science people. But no, not at all. Some of our greatest scientists and artists uh, were the other half. So our, some of our greatest scientists were amazing artists, uh, like Leonardo da Vinci. And some of our greatest artists were uh, interested in science. Like, for example, I posted some some uh, uh, videos recently on my blog, go check them out, about James Cameron, the director. And what I love about him is he's got this amazing mind. This He's a visionary, but what's so amazing about him is that he's like half artist, half scientist. He can draw really well. Like he's a real proper artist. He can just like sketch you a human face and body and it'll look real, really good. But at the same time, he's super nerdy and he's into all the technology and all the science be behind the filmmaking. And so he's pushing the, the 3D and all this stuff, the computer animation and CGI and all this, right? So it's like this amazing blend of both. And you see how powerful that is and how rare that is. Because a lot of times, when you have a hacky scientist or a hacky artist, they are only doing science or only doing art. Where actually the really interesting parts in life are where you are merging various disciplines together. Like I would like to see in universities, the science and art departments start to bleed together, not to be totally different and then look down upon each other. That's not healthy. It's fragmented, you see? You see how the human mind fragments the world to the point where literally we erect walls, physical walls, physical walls. Right now, the president of the United States wants to erect a physical wall between Mexico and the United States. It's, it's absurd <laughs> what people do, you know, or look at the, the Great Wall of China still there after what, 2000 years, however old it is, a thousand years, a thousand and a half years. Look at that. It, it's insane. You can see it from outer space. The human mind is so good at subdividing reality. You, you can see our walls from outer fucking space. Or so it's claimed. I don't know if that's true. See, that's how absurd it is. You know, and then that creates suffering. How many people died to create that wall? They're still buried in the wall. There's skeletons of the people who built that fucking wall inside the Great Wall of China. To this day, they're buried in it. They're bones. How many families were split apart by that wall? Interesting. And of course, why was that wall needed? Well, because there was a division created between the Chinese people and the Mongol people, the invaders from the north. So they needed that wall. <laughs> but the notion of a distinction between a Mongol and a Chinese person it's not as significant as, uh, as they might think. How about the distinction or the duality between science and pseudoscience? Oh man, don't get me started on this. I could shoot a whole episode about this. Um, there's so much ignorance around this topic, especially many people who are spiral dynamic stage orange. They fancy themselves atheists and scientifically minded the Sam Harris <laughs> gang, as we can call them, um, those folks who love to be very rational and, and fact-based, uh, which of course they're not at all. Um, they have no idea what science is, but they create this very simplistic duality between science and pseudoscience. And anything that doesn't fit their existing scientific paradigm, they just automatically label it pseudoscience. And really what that is, is that's just like a dirty word for saying that it's bullshit. They don't realize that this whole distinction is begging the question. It's viciously circular because the whole endeavor of science, the purpose of science, is that we don't know what is true or what is false. And therefore, we have to go and investigate and discover what is true and what is false. We have to sort the wheat from the chaff. That means that science, from the very beginning, does not know a distinction between science and pseudoscience. It doesn't know the distinction between true and false. So what that means is that science is in the business of investigating a lot of bullshit to determine what of it is actually correct. 
you see? So the idea that something like, oh, paranormal phenomena, well, that's pseudoscience, that's horseshit. You should investigate that. Oh, Bigfoot, does Bigfoot exist? Oh, that's pseudoscience, that's bullshit. Science, a real scientist shouldn't study Bigfoot, shouldn't study religion, shouldn't study meditation, shouldn't study psychedelics, shouldn't study telepathic abilities, shouldn't study aliens, because that's all horseshit. It's, it's just utterly absurd. A true scientist has to be so open-minded that he's willing to study anything. No theory can be too crazy or too stupid sounding for a scientist to not investigate it. Now, of course, you have to be careful. I'm not saying that every pseudoscientific idea is correct. In fact, most of them are bullshit. But the whole point is that you don't know. Now, you might say, oh, Leah, but we know, we already know, we, we proved that telepathic abilities don't exist and that paranormal phenomena is all bullshit. We've proven it all. No, you haven't. You're wrong. You haven't proven shit. In fact, paranormal phenomena are very real, and there's a lot of science to back it up. The problem, though, is that you're not willing to accept that science because it doesn't fit your definition of science. You see, the word science is all about how you define it. Who gets to define what science is and what pseudoscience is? Is meditation science or is it pseudoscience? Is a psychedelic science or is it pseudoscience? If I have a brain injury and I start to hallucinate flying monkeys and I start to study that, you know, the monkeys, they fly around, I study them. Am I doing science? If I study what's happening in my dreams, am I doing science? If I go inside of a video game, Super Mario World, VR edition, and I start to study how Mario moves and jumps and what his enemies are and what their favorite food is, am I doing science? The science of Mario World? And that, of course, brings us to the duality between science and religion and science and spirituality. These are held as separate things. In university, these are in totally different departments, having nothing to do with each other. This is a terrible, terrible epistemic blunder of epic proportions uh, that has kept us literally in the dark ages right now with regards to our science and our spirituality. These two need to start communicating with each other. What is religion or spirituality but the science of consciousness? That's literally what it is. Yoga is the science of consciousness. But of course, when you call it that, many scientists, traditional scientists in universities, they object and they say, oh, Leo, yoga is so unscientific. Religion is so unscientific. We're the opposite of religion. Really? Dude, you've got more in common with religion than you're willing to admit. You're just as closed-minded as a religious person, only you do it in a university setting. Maybe that's your problem right there. Conventional science in universities today has no idea what consciousness is. Yet, mankind has had complete understanding of consciousness for over 5,000 years. How is such a travesty possible? How is it possible that mankind knows what consciousness is for five fucking thousand years, and yet our best universities today don't know what consciousness is? Nor are they even interested in learning from those traditions that are 5,000 years old about what consciousness is. That's how big of a problem this is. How about the duality between science and business? Many scientists consider themselves as having nothing to do with business. They're above business and above marketing. Yet this is a very ignorant attitude because actually the university that you're in, doing science in, is a business. And there are very heavy corporate interests and forces, monetary and corporate forces, which are shaping how human science is done right now. Such that, for example, if it doesn't 
allow for a business to earn a lot of money, then they're not going to fund the research. And therefore, you're not going to do the science. Because you're a slave to the, to the capitalist system. So see, science is corrupted by capitalism. Does science understand this? Does science admit this? Usually not at all, because that would take science uh, down a peg. It doesn't want to admit, science doesn't want to admit that science is very biased by uh, financial pressures and influences. Such that the most important science that we could be doing right now, we're not doing because there's no money for it, because no corporation can market it to the masses and make a killing, make billions of dollars, or they can't patent it. For example, psychedelics are not being properly researched in universities because businesses can't make a bunch of money on it because it's illegal. As just one example, meditation is not seriously researched. I mean, there definitely are universities that research meditation these days, uh, but still not nearly enough, not nearly enough. And that's because there's just not a lot of good money to be made from understanding meditation. Unless maybe you want to become a guru like Osho, and then you can make your 91 Rolls Royces or whatever he had. That's, that's pretty good money. Uh, but still pennies compared to the billions that you can earn, for example, if some scientist does some, some research that, uh, you know, creates some new pill that gives you a boner. Okay, well, that, uh, that's, that's good science right there. That's what we consider good science. They'll fund, they'll fund that with billions of dollars. You see how distorted science becomes? And then those people who defend science, they like to say that, well, Leo, science is just the truth, man. It's just facts. It's not biased. It's totally biased. It's completely overrun with corporate interests. What are you talking about? There are so many things that could be researched by science that are not being researched because it is so biased and you don't even know about it, and yet you hold it as the truth. How about the duality between science and culture? This is very important. A lot of scientists, because they want to be rigorous, they tend to deny that science has anything to do with culture, and that science is cultural in any way. Science is not cultural, Leo. Science is factual and objective. Culture, that's all human, fluffy, romantic stuff, airy-fairy stuff, whereas science is based on hard facts. You can't argue with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is not a cultural product. Of course it is. Of course it is. Science is completely cultural. The only reason that science has any validity or authority, rather, not validity, but let me say, rephrase that, authority, has any authority in your mind, is because you were culturally indoctrinated into believing the value and power of science. You understand this? It's completely cultural. We could create a culture where science is not valued at all. Or we could create a technocracy where our entire government and everything that we do is ruled by scientists. Science is a culture. Within science itself, there is culture. And there's even subcultures within various disciplines of science. For example, physicists have their own subculture. Biologists have their own different and unique subculture, and uh, the, the human, you know, social sciences, they have their own unique culture, subculture, which often doesn't get along with the other sciences. What you consider valid evidence, what you even consider is within the domain of science or outside the domain of science, that is cultural. So, for example, most people would not consider yoga, most Western people would not consider yoga to be within the domain of, of science. It's pseudoscience at best. 
But that's because our Western culture has defined it that way. In a thousand years, yoga will be completely incorporated into science, such that when we say science and yoga, people are going to know, oh, those are just the same thing. Just, you know, yoga is a type of science in the same way that like biology is a type of science. They're not opposed to each other. That's a cultural phenomenon. And so one of the things that holds science back so much and the reason science is infested with a lot of delusion and misunderstanding is because it's a, it's a slow, giant, cultural beast. And it takes generations of scientists to die before new generations of scientists are open-minded enough to accept new paradigms. And then that's how science progresses in spite of itself. In spite of itself because it's so cultural. Science is about gathering a collective consensus, which can only be done in a culture. In a certain sense, you can't even do science without a culture. A single individual human, you might almost say, can't do science. Because what, what is science without a consensus of various experts? They have to agree with each other. They have to have a, a common language which is culture. They have to have a common set of values so that they don't kill each other to even do their science. That's culture. So many scientists are in denial about this. Now, of course, I'm not saying that science is purely cultural. It's not just cultural. I'm just saying that these this duality between science and culture is not so clear-cut and black and white as you've been led to believe. How about the duality between chemistry and biology? Where does one end and the other begin? You can't draw a line between them. Molecular biology is right in the middle of both. To be a good biologist, you got to understand chemistry. To be a good, um, well, I don't know if you need to understand biology to be a good chemist, but, um, but certainly those two, um, those two work in tandem with each other. How about the duality between hard science and soft science? This is one that uh, you find within universities. Usually there's like half the university has hard sciences, like physics, biology, chemistry, and so forth. And then the other half of the university, <laughs> you know, separated by some kind of wall, of course, in a different building. Uh, maybe there's a park in between, something a little, a little less less oppressive than a wall, probably a park, um, separating from the uh, soft sciences, like the humanities. And, you know, the people in the hard sciences, they laugh at those in the soft sciences and say, oh, look at those, those softies over there. They don't really do serious science. We're the ones doing real science here within the physics. But in a certain sense, physics is the easiest science to do. Hard sciences, in a certain sense, are the easiest because there are so few variables there I mean, there's still a lot of variables, but relatively so few variables there compared to a social science that it's so much easier to create a model of fundamental particles within quantum mechanics than it is to create a model of, for example, um, human behavior. Humans are so complex. So, of course, soft sciences like psychology, for example, or history or sociology or anthropology, this sorts, these sorts of softer sciences um, they're so much more difficult to do well precisely because there's so many variables and it's so easy for your mind to deceive you and it's very difficult to run experiments, clear-cut experiments because, for example, every human being is different so you can't just treat them all the same the way that a biologist might, for example, treat all uh, rats the same in a maze. And even there, that you know, it's not going to work if you treat all rats the same. You still have to distinguish between different kinds of rats, but uh, a lot easier than dealing with humans. And, you know, a lot of scientists, for example, the hard scientists, they tend to look at humans as rats and they tend to treat them as rats. Um, and then the, the, all sorts of things go wrong. You know, that hard scientist, that physicist, he comes home to his wife after a long day of work and then he treats her like a rat. <laughs> that's how he treats her because that's how he thinks of humans because, you know, he's just so... He's so dead set on looking at the world in an analytical, logical frame of mind, which is good for hard science, but terrible in your relationships. Speaking of which, is there a science of relationships? Well, if there is, 
that physicist sucks at it. <laughs> of course, I'm stereotyping here. There are physicists who are good at relationships, but um, just just um, these are stereotypes. Uh, and I say them tongue in cheek a lot of times. How about the duality between natural and unnatural or not natural and artificial? This uh, trips a lot of people up. They get cut up on like, well, is that natural food or unnatural food? Well, what is unnatural food? Well, it's like, well, like, you know, Coca-Cola is unnatural food. But why is it unnatural? Because a human being made it? Are human beings not natural? Hmm. Where did human beings come from? Are the human beings not part of nature? See? So what does it really mean that something is natural or artificial? Anything artificial is made by nature, so it's natural. Human cities are not artificial, they're natural. We're just like a fungus that's growing on the earth. That's what we are. Everything is natural. When you understand that, then you transcend natural and artificial to natural with a capital N. So now I'm talking about the absolute again. Natural with a capital N. That's when you realize everything is natural including all human stuff. A human factory is totally natural. <laughs> it's sprung up on the earth like a mushroom. There it is. Pumping out cars the way that a mushroom pumps out spores. How about the duality between evolution and creation or evolution and design? Oh boy, this is very tricky. Very tricky. A lot of people get deluded here thinking that somehow these are opposites. Well, you got evolution or you got creation and design, but they, they can't be both. Evolution is creation. And creation is evolution. All design is evolutionary. I'll talk a lot more about this topic in the future about evolution. So I'm just going to gloss over it here. But I want you to notice that every single design that a human being has ever made has been evolutionary, has actually been a part of evolution, actually came out of evolution. Like, for example, the iPhone, you know, your Model 1 iPhone, first generation, um, was one thing. And then the second generation, third, tenth, tenth generation, that, that's all evolution happening. Evolution is not limited to biology by any stretch of, uh, of the imagination. It's, it's everywhere. Everything is evolution. You're living evolution. And evolution is not separate from design. Now, you might say, oh, Leo, you're just playing clever word games here. You're just trying to, to make it seem as though the universe is designed when really it evolved. So you're just playing word games. <laughs> no, I'm not playing word games. You're the one playing word games. I'm actually showing you that um, what I'm talking about here goes way beyond words. I'm actually talking about the physical substrate of, of existence. <laughs> not words, the, the metaphysics of existence. The actual stuff that you think is real, what I'm telling you is that that's words. That's dualities. We're getting there. We're not quite there yet. Those are going to be the existential dualities. We're not there yet. We're building up to it. Uh, next duality, inside, outside, internal, external. If you look closely at any object, you will not be able to draw a boundary between its inside and its outside. Impossible. Impossible. You can't determine what's inside of a human and what's outside of a human. Where is that point where the inside of a human is the outside of a human? Is this, is this the outside of a human or is that the inside of a human? And where does it stop? Does it stop at my lip? Does it stop inside my mouth? Does it have to go all the way in my, in my guts? You know, a human being is actually like a donut. If you think about it, it's like a long stretched out donut. The hole going into your mouth goes all the way through your belly. All that comes out your ass. And that's like you like being a donut. <laughs> See? So the inside and outside are two sides of one coin. How about the duality of micro versus macro? What's micro and what's macro? These are totally relative. Is a human being a micro or a macro object? Well, relative to a galaxy, I'm a micro object, but relative to a quark or subatomic particle, I'm a macro. Uh, 
yeah, I'm, I'm micro relative to a galaxy, I'm macro relative to a subatomic particle. How about uh, the duality between Western and Eastern medicine? That's huge, huge. You know how many thousands of people die in America simply because our culture, our scientific institutions, our educational institutions, and our medical system has completely botched this duality between Western and Eastern medicine. They reject Eastern medicines, which could cure many serious, deadly diseases in the West. Completely rejected because there's this idea that if it's coming from the East, then it can't be real. It's not, it's not proven. It's dangerous. How about the duality between rational and irrational? You think these are two separate things? Take the most rational person in the world, and I'll show you someone who's more irrational than they are actually rational. Most rational people, their rationality has been co completely co-opted by their ego, which is completely co-opted by their emotional system and their needs. So the people who proclaim that they're the most rational, they are actually the most irrational and utterly driven by their egoic biases and emotional needs. Which is precisely why they're so triggered by irrationality. See, what a rational person has done is he's created a shadow out of the irrational because he doesn't know how to handle it or how to deal with it. So he's actually fragmented himself. He himself is disconnected from his body and his emotions. He's living in like the left hemisphere of his mind, his brain. And, um, and as his whole attitude towards the world is, is completely severed in this way, so then he has to create this shadow, and then anytime he sees irrational activity out there in the world, whether it's religion, or it's women, or femininity, or uh, children, or whatever, he gets upset by it, because he can't control it and manipulate it the way that his ego wants. And you call that rational? That's the height of irrationality. How about the duality between rational and intuitive? Which are you? Are you rational or are you intuitive? Can you be both? How is rationality actually informed by intuition? And how is intuition actually safeguarded? Um, and made more concrete through rationality. It's very interesting that the best logicians are highly intuitive people. The best mathematicians are highly intuitive. Isn't that interesting? Most of our genius mathematicians, when they're solving some unsolvable mathematical logical proof, the way they do it is intuitively. They intuit the answer long before they're able to formally prove it. Quite amazing. Good example of that is Kurt Gödel. He's very, very rational on the one hand, yet his rationality is completely grounded in intuition on the other hand. How about the duality between skepticism and faith? These are sometimes pitted against each other as opposites, but are they really? Check out my episode, True versus False Skepticism, where I rant against this. I rant against false skepticism, and I talk about how most skeptics these days, they're not true skeptics at all, they're hypocrites, because they don't question their own skepticism. And so they're skeptical about everything except for their skepticism. Therefore, in effect, they have faith in skepticism, which is, of course, <laughs> very ironic, very hypocritical, uh, very misguided. That's exactly right. Skepticism is a very counterintuitive thing, because if you were truly skeptical, you'd also be skeptical of your skepticism. And where would that leave you? That would leave you groundless. But most skeptics these days, people who proclaim themselves as skeptics, they're not actually groundless. They're dogmatists. But if you actually read the outlines of, uh, of Pyrrhonism, where skepticism came from, 
from the uh, from the ancient Greek Pyrrho and from Sexus Empiricus, uh, one of his acolytes. If you if you actually read the original Greek skeptic works, the whole point of skepticism was to not be dogmatic, and yet today people have turned skepticism into dogma of its own, into a dogma of its own, which is uh, terribly tragic and highly deluded. But good luck convincing one of these skeptics that he's wrong. Because <laughs> he has such absolute faith in his skepticism. I mean, it's a joke. It literally is a joke. Arguing against these rationalists, like Sam Harris types, uh, these skeptics, these atheists, it's, it's just like, it's a farce is what it is. It's a, it's, it deserves to be like a comedy. You can make a comedy movie out of it. Because it's so stupid. It's so myopic. It's so non-integral. It, it lacks perspective. So lacks perspective. It's so far from truth. But uh, I'm getting on a rant here. Uh, moving on. How about the duality between fact and interpretation? Or empirical data versus interpretation? Sometimes this is framed as facts don't care about your feelings which is the most idiotic thing that a human being has ever said. <laughs> because all of your logic and all of your citing of facts is completely dictated by your feelings. Completely. You think you can separate a fact from interpretation of the fact? You haven't investigated this topic at all if you think that. The whole can of worms that is epistemology is this problem of our inability to distinguish between what is a fact and what is an interpretation and what are our reasons versus our feelings. In fact, those people who adamantly state that facts are superior to feelings and that facts can be separated from interpretation in a sort of simplistic notion of science where it's like, well, the data doesn't, as Sam Harris says, I think he says, uh, the data, the data cannot lie. The math cannot lie. <laughs> that's, that's about as, as stupid as saying that statistics cannot lie. You cannot make this separation at all. But what I was saying is that um, those people who adamantly insist that it's possible to separate facts from feelings and facts from interpretation, they themselves are doing that from a position of emotional attachment and feeling. They're attached to that. <laughs> so it's not factual. It's completely emotional, which is why they're so adamant about it and they get so emotional about it. They get angry and upset about it, especially if you point this out to them. They'll start to do all sorts of mental gymnastics and they'll start to call you all sorts of names and demonize you and so forth. Of course, because it's all ego. Ego doesn't give a shit about facts or truth. Ego cares about its agenda and all of your feelings in your entire emotional system is your egoic agenda. That's all it is. Feelings are just a way for your ego to get what it wants. That's all it is. Facts don't matter at all. You don't give a fuck about facts. In fact, you don't even know what a fact is. What is a fact? You don't have a single fact. All you have are interpretations. Even the concept of a fact is already an interpretation. <laughs> See, this is the whole problem of science. Science is under this uh, simple-minded illusion that it can separate experimental data from the interpretation of that data when actually it can't do that. It doesn't know how to do that. How about the duality of dependent versus independent or contingent versus necessary? It's not so easy to determine what is dependent and what is independent. Point to one thing in the universe that is independent. Everything is dependent upon everything else. 
How about the uh, philosophical duality of a, post a priori versus a, posteri a posteriori? This is sort of a nerdy uh, duality that you've probably only heard if you've studied philosophy. But this is a big one that they argue about over and over again. Centuries of philosophers arguing versus, versus, is this truth here, is it a priori or is it a posteriori? And what they mean by that is a priori means uh, independent of experience, prior to experience, and then a posteriori means dependent upon experience. Um, and, uh, and of course, you can't separate the two. You can't separate the two. Or... Uh, there's also another philosophical distinction between analytic and synthetic. There's analytic truths and synthetic truths. For example, 1 plus 1 equals 2 is considered an analytical truth because you can just get that by, uh, by just kind of like looking at what it is, at looking at the definitions of the terms. It's definitional, you might say. True by definition. That's analytic. And then synthetic means that it has to be gathered from facts out in the world. So if I study you know, rabbits, and I see that they have two ears, if they all have two ears, well, that's a synthetic truth. Um, you can't make that distinction. And again, philosophers have argued about this distinction for hundreds of years, as though you can make this distinction, but you never really could. Um, Willard Quine, the philosopher, has a really good essay talking about the, the two dogmas of empiricism, and he talks about how you can't, you can't, uh, you can't maintain the analytic-synthetic distinction which is, of course, completely correct. But that fact is still lost on most people doing philosophy. How about the duality between relevant and irrelevant? That's completely relative. What is relevant and what is irrelevant? Completely depends on your ego and what your goals are and what you're doing. How about the duality between quantitative and qualitative? Sometimes scientists and Intellectual types will like to make this distinction. It sounds very intellectual to say, oh, this thing is quantitative and is a, and then this thing is a qualitative difference. <laughs> of course, there is no such distinction. There is no such distinction. The way reality works is that quantitative differences become qualitative differences. Like, if you have two people in a room, that's one situation. If you have a thousand people in a room, that's a totally different situation. That's a qualitative difference, not just a quantitative difference. The quantity of people in the room made a qualitative difference to how that group of people will behave as a herd. And then if you get a billion people together in a room or uh, in a city or something, um, that's going to produce yet another order of new emergent phenomenon going from a quantitative to a totally new qualitative, you know, difference. For example, you can't create a nation with two people, but you can create a nation with a billion people. And that's, that's quantitative turning into qualitative. And perhaps the best example of this is with, uh, with nuclear weapons. If you get enough plutonium together, by increasing quantity, eventually it'll reach a critical mass and there will be a massive qualitative difference called a nuclear explosion. Quantity turns into quality in that nuclear explosion. But if you have just a little bit less plutonium than enough to reach the critical mass, it won't explode, no matter what you do to it. Very interesting. How about the duality between natural and supernatural? This creates a lot of confusion among scientifically minded people because they tend to hold that supernatural is impossible and unreal. But of course, uh, the goalposts on this moves all the time. What is supernatural and what is natural? Something that is natural today used to be supernatural 500 years ago. Something that will be natural tomorrow um, is considered supernatural today based on how, how culture changes. So what is considered natural or supernatural is not defined by actual facts at all. It has nothing to do with science or physics or, or objective truth. It's completely relative. 
So whatever our culture says is natural is natural, and whatever our culture considers supernatural is supernatural. So for example, if you considered x-rays natural today, uh, do you realize that 200 years ago, x-rays were considered hocus-pocus, supernatural stuff, if you talked about it? If you took an iPhone, got into a time machine, took an iPhone back to the, to the ancient Roman days, and showed them your iPhone, they would think you're a supernatural sorcerer. See? Stuff that science will discover 100 years from now, if we talked about it today in a university, it would be called supernatural pseudoscience malarkey. And these are not just word games. I actually mean that there are supernatural phenomena, what you consider supernatural phenomena. Of course, when you actually become fully conscious of these supernatural phenomena, they just become totally natural to you. So for example, you can develop telepathic abilities by doing yoga and psychedelics and so forth. Um, and it'll be totally natural. You'll be telepathic, but it'll be totally natural to you. But of course, to everyone else, it'll be very supernatural. And they'll think you're either full of shit or that you're a witch. And of course, you know, we burn the witches at the stake. Or at the very least, we demonize and mock them to the point where we can dismiss what they, what they have to offer. So the natural, supernatural distinction can be transcended to the absolute, which is supernatural. Supernatural with a capital S, which means that everything is supernatural. Electricity is supernatural. Magnetism is supernatural. Light is supernatural. Supernature. Here it is. Look. The human body is supernatural. You can become conscious of that. If you become conscious of the absolute, that'll open you up to new possibilities, new abilities, cities, and so forth. Uh, the next uh, duality. Mind versus body. Mind versus brain. Oh, boy. This is a huge, huge can of worms. Western philosophy and science has been dealing with the mind-body problem, as it's known, for over 500 years at least, since Descartes. Uh, still has not been resolved officially, but of course, <laughs> it's long been resolved by yogis and by mystics um, for over 5,000 years, like I said. The mind-body problem has been resolved for over 5,000 years, but People don't want to learn non-duality. So you got it. The only way to resolve the mind-body problem is by uh, becoming non-dual and understanding the things that I'm talking about here. So what's more primary, the mind or the body? Is the mind in the brain or is the brain in the mind? Uh, ultimately, what you have is a transcendence of both, a unification and uh, the merging of the subject, the subject and the object, and you have the absolute of mind with capital M. So what you become conscious of is that everything is mind. That chair is mind. That building is mind. This is not just a word game. You can actually become conscious of it, thereby transcending this duality. Uh, another common one that's related to this is physical versus mental. Is the universe physical or is it mental? It's psychophysical, or mental with a capital M. Everything that you know that is quote-unquote physical is actually mental. But you see, mental can take the form of physical stuff, which is something that you haven't really taken serious as a possibility before. So that chair, it looks physical. It is physical, but that's because the mentality of the entire universe is doing physics. There it is in its physical form. Again, you might think this is a word game, but it's not a word game. I'm telling you new things you can become conscious of. All this stuff I'm talking about is new stuff. Don't think you understand this stuff or that you have reached the end of this. This is all new stuff for you. That's how you should treat everything I say. How about the duality between physical and non-physical? Well, everything is non-physical. Non-physical with a capital N. How about material versus immaterial? Everything is ultimately immaterial. Immaterial is an absolute. Immaterial with a capital I. 
How about the duality of same versus different? I have a very long and deep uh, episode about that called um, Sameness versus Difference. Go check that out if you want more about that. Um, but is sameness different from difference or is sameness the same? If two things are different, aren't they then the same? Because they're both different? This one is such a mindfuck. Contemplate that one. How about variable versus constant? Those are related. How about input versus output? Have you noticed that every input is some output? Like the output of the words coming out of my mouth is actually the input of various kinds of things that I've studied and contemplated. So the stuff that I study and contemplate, the work that I do, meditation, so forth, that's the input. The output is the words. But the output now of the, these words are now entering your ears, which is now my words, my output is turning into your input. Now this information is going into your mind, and now this becomes the input into your mind, which then becomes the next output. So now when you go speak to a friend of yours or to a family member, and you say, oh, Leo told me this, and let me teach you about non-duality, now <laughs> my output your input has now turned to your output. And so and on, so and so it goes to infinity. Reality is an infinite chain of inputs and outputs. All crisscrossing with each other in an infinitely tangled uh, web. How about form versus function as a duality? Sometimes people talk about these as though they're two different things. But the function of a thing is determined by its form. You can't really separate these two. Take a look at any animal. The function of an animal body is its form. Literally. It's embodying functions. So, for example, maybe the function of a bird, you might say, is to fly. Um... And in order to do that, it has to have a certain form. It has to have a wing, or it has to have a pointy nose in order to reduce wind resistance, or it has to have light bones with air pockets in them so that it can fly. So the form of the bird determines its function. And of course, the same with all human-made uh, inventions and devices. How about the duality between syntax and semantics? Sometimes these are separated, so they're different, but they're not. They're closely related. How about controller versus controlled? This is a very thorny issue. Are you in control of your life? Or is society controlling you? Who's controlling who? It might seem like society is controlling you because society teaches you culture and educates you and all this. So it controls you, but then at the, uh, on the other hand, you can also then, uh, for example, start your own school and start to teach your own ideas. And now you become the controller. You can actually become like president of the country and then change the country, change the education system in the country, which now you went from being controlled to now becoming a controller. But the controlling you're doing is coming from the controlled person that you were. The way you're controlling the country depends on how you were controlled by the country when you were educated. And so it goes in an infinite chain without end. So who is controlling who? You think you're in control of your life, but are you really? Speaking of which, that leads us to the duality of uh, determinism versus free will. This is a duality. You can transcend this duality to realize will with a capital W. Divine will, absolute will, God's will. 
that's a that's a very tricky issue which I'll discuss separately in the future. How about the uh, duality between analysis and synthesis, or analysis and holism? A lot of what science does these days is it has a bias towards analysis. It breaks everything up into pieces without doing high-quality synthesis or holistic big-picture thinking. This creates a lot of problems. But of course, you can't just do big-picture thinking and synthesis without analysis. You need to be able to do both, and you need to be able to balance between these two. Holism and analysis together. That would be holism with a capital H. See, holism with a capital, with a lowercase h, that's holism which just tries to be holistic but never tries to do any analysis. It rejects analysis. But holism with a capital H transcends and includes both. And uh, that's what's really powerful. That's what we need within science. How about the duality of technology versus magic? Who is it that has that beautiful quote about how technology is indistinguishable from magic? Is it Arthur C. Clarke or Carl Sagan? I forget who, but uh, one of the two. Um, it's a really good quote, but it, it goes way deeper than most uh, people who say that quote actually realize. Because the point is that everything is magic. All technology is actually magic. That's what it is. Reality is, itself is magic, but you're missing the magic of it. It's not a word game. You have to actually become conscious that it's magic. How about the duality of cause and effect? This is sort of similar to input and output. Have you noticed that every effect is the cause of something else? So, for example, I might light a firecracker. And so the cause of the firecracker exploding will be my lighter that I light it with. Let's say that's the cause of the explosion. But then the explosion itself, let's say that's the effect, right? The, the effect. Uh, but then the explosion creates a sound or causes a sound, I should say. So the effect of the explosion is this new thing, a sound. So it's been caused. The explosion causes the sound. So the effect now creates a new cause. And that sound is itself now an effect of the explosion. But that sound, when it hits my ears, it causes me to now react in some way. Maybe it's very loud, and so I, I need to now close my ears, um, or I feel some pain. So the effect of the sound has caused pain in me. And so the chain goes on and on and on to infinity forever. Science loves to break apart reality into causes and effects, and usually it only looks at cause and effect in a very simple linear manner, like A causes B causes C. But in fact, reality is, like I said, with those inputs and outputs, just this vast, infinite, multidimensional nest or web of cause and effect, which all are like ripples in a pond. Imagine a million ripples in a, you know, pebbles thrown in a pond, all the rings intersect with each other into this complicated pattern. Um, that's how cause and effect really works. Science has a lot of work to do before it fully understands uh, the problems it creates for itself with this cause and effect duality. It does not understand the depth of this problem. How about the duality of consistent versus contradictory? People often hold contradiction as though it's a mistake or it's awful or it's a, it's a, it's a sign of error or falsehood. This is not at all the case. People like to demonize contradiction. That's not the case at all. As uh, we talked about in my episode about Gödel's incompleteness theorem, it's uh, one of the most uh, remarkable discoveries within within mathematics and logic and all of human science and philosophy, basically, because what Kurt Gödel demonstrated is that any formal system that uses symbols that is complex enough in order to be able to speak about itself or 
to self-reflect, it must necessarily be able to contradict itself. So if the system is rich enough and it seeks to be consistent, it will ultimately become contradictory. In the same way that I can use language to reflect on itself and I can say something like, I am a liar. Is it true or is it false that I'm a liar? If I'm telling the truth, that means I'm a liar. And that means you can't trust what I said because it's false. But if I'm not telling the truth and I say I'm a liar, then you can't take what I said as being true. And so there's also a contradiction. So it contradicts in both directions because that's a property of self-reflection. And the reason that that happens is because reality is non-dual. <laughs> you can't use symbols to accurately capture the totality of reality because symbols are a portion, not the whole. But uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a lot for you to understand if that's the first time you're going to be hearing it. Contemplate it. <laughs> or go watch that episode about Kurt Goodell. G-O-D-E-L. Next duality, discovery versus invention. Was gravity invented or was it discovered? Was quantum mechanics invented or was it discovered? Uh, materialists tend to hold that, no, Leo, these aren't inventions, these are discoveries. Gravity is not an invention, discovery. <clears throat> it's not so simple, though. Not so simple at all. In a very important sense, gravity was invented. In a very important sense, quantum mechanics is an invention, not a discovery. Contemplate that. <laughs> There's a lot that could, more that could be said about that. How about the duality of heterogeneous versus homogeneous? Or linear versus nonlinear? We'll talk about that one in the future. Or problem versus solution? This one's very interesting because a lot of times we get stuck on our problems and we tend to like think of problems and solutions as polar opposites without realizing that within the problem lies the solution. And then every solution comes with new problems. <laughs> Have you noticed this? Yeah. How you frame your problems determines what kind of solutions you'll get. How about the duality of possible versus impossible? Are there certain things that are just impossible within reality? Or is everything possible? Well, it turns out, actually, if you become conscious of the absolute, that everything is possible because reality is infinitely, infinitely powerful. Um, it has no restrictions or limits on it whatsoever. That's what infinity means, unlimited, unbounded. So literally all possibilities are possible for it. So you might say that it's impossible for anything to be impossible, therefore making everything possible. This is possible with a capital P as an absolute. That's something you can become conscious of. How about the duality of the chicken and the egg problem? That's a classic one. Which came first? Well, of course, the chicken is the egg. You can't have a chicken without an egg. And you can't have an egg without a chicken. How about the duality of credentialed versus uncredentialed? This is a big one within science. Everyone in science is trying to become credentialed as credentialed as possible. And they look down upon those people who are uncredentialed because they're somehow unscientific. But the irony, of course, is that those uncredentialed people can discover true things about reality which belong within the domain of science. So this, this demand for credentials really is very anti-scientific if you think about it. Because credentials are a human cultural phenomenon, whereas making discoveries about truth, which is what science is purportedly supposed to be about, 
You don't need a diploma to do that. You don't need a PhD. You don't need a Nobel Prize. It doesn't matter how many papers you've written. Tomorrow, you could discover the greatest truth about black holes or about quantum mechanics or about relativity. Anyone can do it. Now, of course, it's much, much less likely. I'm not saying that you should discount credentials. They have some value. I certainly want, wouldn't want to go to a doctor who didn't have a, you know, a medical diploma. I want a credential doctor. So that's a nice safety net. But at the same time, there are many credential doctors who are terrible doctors. And there are many people in the world who have no credentials who could heal you of cancer or uh, other terrible ail ailments that you have. Completely uncredentialed. That could actually save your life. Understanding this one duality could save your whole life if you get cancer. Because most people in the West, they get cancer and they only go for credential treatments. Oftentimes, they don't work. Of course, it could kill you too. If you go to some uncredentialed quack who gives you some sort of terrible remedy that is going to kill you, it will kill you. So I'm not saying that you should just, you know, go use quacks without any kind of uh, mm, evaluation. You got to think this stuff through. You have to be careful. That's what science is. The whole endeavor of science is that it's not safe. It's risky. You don't know what's true and what's false. You got to experiment. And when you're experimenting, there's risk. You could do an experiment that's going to waste a lot of years and, and not turn out any good result. It might even kill you, you know? Scientists did experiments with x-rays and radiation, and then they died from it. That's science. It's risky. Whereas today, most people, they take science so for granted, that they just expect science to like deliver truth to them on a silver platter with zero risk. That's not science. That's fucking faith and dogma. That's what that is. You want safety, which is what religion is. And you're making a shadow out of religion because you want safety, but then you hate religious people for wanting safety from religious ideas. But then you use scientific ideas in order to get yourself safety. It's absurd. Absurd. How about the duality of the newbie versus the expert versus the master? Oftentimes, we like to pick on newbies as though they're bad or they're inferior somehow. But every master started life as a newbie. Everyone, no exceptions. So, if you want to encourage people to become masters and experts, you need to um, be nice to them as newbies. You need to encourage them as newbies. How many newbies are scared off and never become masters because they're so bullied as a newbie that they just quit because there's nobody there to, to encourage them? You know, a really good teacher, the whole point of a really good teacher is that he takes a newbie and he instills in the newbie a sense of possibility and vision and inspiration, motivation, and shows him techniques how to do stuff and makes him have hope and faith in himself, makes him believe in himself, gives him a sense of confidence, teaches all that such that the newbie can become an expert through a lot of effort and then from an expert become a master. And so when you become an expert, usually you're very arrogant towards newbies. But once you become a master, it goes full circle and actually you become very understanding and humble with newbies because you understand that really it's just one circle. You know, it goes round and round and round. That's what life is about here, going from newbie to master. And um, it's not personal. You can't judge people for having lack of experience. We all start life with zero experience. There's no point in judging someone for having little experience in physics or chemistry or medicine or spirituality or psychology or personal development or business or anything. We all start at zero. So who are you judging? You're only judging yourself. You're being deluded. And then we have uh, the final scientific duality. We still haven't gotten to the existential ones. Um which is the map versus the territory. How many times have you heard me say that the, uh, the map is not the territory? That's a very profound truth. Yet at the same time, if you separate the map from the territory and you hold it as two separate polar opposite things, you've created a duality and you're deluded. 
So actually, what I'm here to tell you is that the map is the territory. Leo, which is true. I thought you said the map is not the territory. Now you're telling me the map is a territory. Well, of course, the map was always the territory because what is a map but a part of the territory? All there is is territory. Let me explain. So, for example, if I'm standing in New York City and I'm drawing a map of New York City, if I'm going to draw a really accurate map of New York City, I also have to include an image on the map of myself standing there drawing the map. And inside that map that I draw, I will have to include another image of myself drawing another map. Why does this happen? And of course, it goes to infinity. This shows you the infinite nature of reality. It shows you why symbols cannot capture all of reality. Um, that's why this happens. This is the same issue as we were running into with uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem and self-reflection, uh, the, the sort of liar paradox that I just ran through a few minutes ago. So it's the same problem. That's because all there really is is territory. See? So, like, if I'm drawing a map here, this map, it's not like existing in some other universe or some other dimension. It's part of reality. So, if we want to capture all of reality, we also have to include into it any maps, models, thoughts, ideas, or images. So, thoughts and images are a part of reality. Which, of course, connects back with, with that... Um, Mm. point I made about the mind-body problem. There is no boundary between mind and body. So the thoughts that you're having are just as real as your hands, just as real as your head, just as real as your brain. Of course, <laughs> you have to be conscious that your brain is actually a thought. Uh, it's something you're thinking, at least right now. When you're actually looking at it, that's a different story. But you're thinking about looking at it, aren't you? That's a thought. But a thought is real. You just have to distinguish between a thought and a hand and a foot and a car and a tree. and a, I mean, they're different things, but they're not separate from each other. They're still one. It's tricky. Uh, go through it slowly and really contemplate. Each one of these, you got to understand that each one of these dualities that I'm talking about you could spend months contemplating each one. I'm giving you a list of 250 of them. You could spend the next 20 years contemplating everything I said here, and you still won't understand everything that there is to understand here. That's how deep this goes. That's how wide it goes as well. It goes deep and wide. <laughs> infinitely deep and infinitely wide, both at once. All right, I'm tired of talking, and I've only gotten through half the material. So intermission here. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Well, I was uh, going to cover the rest of the list here, the existential dualities that I promised you, but uh, <laughs> there's too much material, I think, to stuff into this episode. So what I decided is that this will be part two. This is the end of part two. We're going to sort of leave it as a cliffhanger, and then next week there will be part three. But I'm warning you, it's very important that you stick around for part three, because the whole point of this series was to build up towards the very end. And now finally we've gotten to the point where now we can talk about the existential dualities, that which is the foundation of all of existence, <laughs> to put it mildly. So you're going to want to stick around for that, and then I'll have some concluding uh, remarks to tie it all together and to show you the significance of, uh, of this master list that I'm giving you. What I want you to do for me, though, over the next week, is I want you to start to put the things that I'm telling you into practice and to start to notice these dualities functioning in your everyday life. And I want you to start to keep a list. So maybe use the examples I gave you to start off your list, but then come up with your own. I want you to actually start keeping a list of dualities that you're noticing at school, at work, in your family with your art, when you're watching television, whatever it is, start keeping a list because I want you to start to get a sense of the extent of this, <laughs> both the, the, the depth, the breadth and the depth of it. All right. Um, 
this is the nature of all of existence right here that we're talking about. From the little to the big, from all the parts to all the holes. So we're explaining it all. <laughs> but you have to actually contemplate these examples for yourself. You have to kind of work through them almost like a logical proof or like a mathematical equation that you're solving that you've been given in math class. Because the danger here is that I'm giving you this massive list, which has personally taken me over a year to compile, thinking about it, contemplating it, and then it's taken me many years before that even to to study duality and non-duality, to reconcile all these things in my mind through various examples and experiences for myself. So the only way that you're going to really get the value of this list and really be able to appreciate it and have it to change your life so that it's not just theory and philosophy is if you start to actually do the math problems, so to speak here, right? Take one of these examples, think through it. If one of these examples that I gave to you doesn't make sense or you disagree with it, or you think I'm wrong, or whatever, good. Investigate that. This is not about you believing my list as though I'm some sort of authority figure with a list for you to believe, like some sort of Ten Commandments. That's not what Actualize.org is. I'm just giving you uh, pointers and hints at stuff that you can explore for yourself and then see what the result of that is. It's not helpful for you just to believe me and to say, oh, well, Leo, yeah, I trust you, Leo. I think you're smart, so I'll just, I'll, I'll just believe your list. That's not going to help you. In the same way that it's not going to help you to just believe your math teacher giving you answers to math problems. To learn mathematics, you have to go through the work. Yes, it takes work. The point is that it's actually highly useful and practical, but only when you're doing the work. Not as a philosophy. It does no good for you to go around telling your friends and your family, oh, well, I know about duality. Let me tell you about how the world is dualistic. And yada, yada, yada. You just, you just talk and talk and talk about all the examples. Maybe you memorize all the examples I give you, and then you just spit it out at them. That doesn't help to improve your life. That doesn't make you any happier. The point is that you need to, like, see how it's working and see the limitations of that dualistic frame of mind that you are applying to all of the world. In business, in relationships, at school, at, within science, and, and everywhere else. Right? Um, that's where the results come from. So spend the next week starting to do that, and then I'll give you some more uh, profound examples to wrap it all up. And then you can do some more months and years of, of, of following up on the stuff that I give you in part three. So make sure you stick around for that.